Welcome to Calvary Baltimore B-Sides. With a deeper look behind the sermon, here's Pastor Josh. Well, welcome everybody. I am... Um, oh, welcome, welcome. I am... Um, uh, the only problem... The only problem with trying to do these things on, on Monday morning by myself is I have two screens. I got one with my notes. I got one with... Um, like all the software that it requires to run this. And then I have the chat on my phone. It's like <laughs> trying to make sure all the right toggles are switched because I have to switch them when everything's off. It's a whole thing. So I'm like, oh no. Anyways, I love y'all. Um, welcome to B-Side. Uh, this will be uh, the B-Side to Sunday morning's message on baptism. Uh, that This is going to look a little different. Um, I was thinking about what I wanted to share today, um, because obviously I, uh, thoroughly ran through the Great Commission on baptism, and then I could have switched that on missions, which maybe I'll do Sunday, we'll see. Um, but I could have turned that around and, and gone that way, but I just, I wanted to stick with the theme of baptism. But there wasn't that much left over from our Sunday morning text. And I thought, you know, this would be a really good opportunity to take us through baptism in the early church. Um, and I'm really excited about this. I hope this isn't a snooze fest to you watching, though I think this is highly informative and, and even important. Um, we need to understand our history and how we got here. After all, isn't a lot of our Bible really just recorded history? It's what the book of Acts is. It's the history of the early church. Um, and so let me just say before we get into, um, I pulled three writings for us today. <laughs> um, first of all, just because something's recorded um, from the early church, and today we're looking at just the first 200 years, um, after Jesus died, um, or really the first 200 years of, um, since the birth of Christ, <clears throat> um, just because someone wrote something that doesn't make it true, <laughs> doesn't make it automatically right. Uh, and, and, you know, a lot of times you'll hear pastors and they'll say things like, we got to get back to the early church. We got to get back to the early church. And Pentecostals really like to go down this road because, you know, they read about all of the miracles and they assume the reason there aren't miracles today are because of a lapse of faith, not because God was doing miracles in that time for a special reason. And that's a whole nother um, discussion, which one I'm willing to have. <clears throat> um, but they say we got to get back to the purity of the early church. And and the reality is, have you read First Corinthians? <laughs> the early church was messed up. Same thing with 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. The church was had a lot of issues. Same thing with uh, the seven letters to Revelation, in the book of Revelation. Uh, in fact, I think what is it, all but one or two of the churches were absolutely dysfunctional? So the majority of the early church was off in a lot of things. Uh, so the early church, again, it, they had a lot of things right, uh, but the early church had a lot of problems. Um, but that being said, we still can learn a great deal about people that learned directly from the apostles or were maybe too removed from the apostles. For example, you know, we have uh, Irenaeus, who is the disciple of Polycarp. Polycarp was the disciple of John. So we have some of what Polycarp said, which is fascinating. We have a lot of what Irenaeus said. Uh, and there's there's some good stuff to get to get from there. I was I was studying earlier that um, Irenaeus wrote a great deal. He, he wrote a lot of things called Refutations Against Heresies. Um, <clears throat> and um, a lot of people, he, he referenced a lot of books that, you know, uh, a lot of things about Gnostics that people didn't know. <laughs> we, we had no way to prove it. And about... Um, within Since the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, the last hundred years... Uh, and, and, spe and some dig sites in Egypt, they've actually pulled up some old Gnostic writings and realized a lot of what he was saying about the Gnostics, 
that reflected in John's writing were actually true. Uh, so there's there's some really cool stuff to be learned from from these early guys. Uh, and today I want to look at what they said on baptism. So before we do that, let's pray. Um, God, we love you. We praise you and we thank you. We ask that you would uh, bless this time. Give us wisdom. Uh, God, help us to be clear minded. And thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> oh, excuse me. <laughs> excuse me again i've exercised the demon uh rob ranenberger i'm sure they were but is there any documentation of the apostles being baptized um if there is i don't know but i'm gonna chew on that rob and i'll let i'll, I'll follow up with you later on that the problem is with some of these early church writings um <sighs> christians were a people of the book and a lot of secular artists in the first few hundred years of, and really hasn't ever stopped, but in the first few hundred years of church history, um, and even during the intertestamental period, they realized that the Jews and, and then later the Christians, the Jewish people and the Christians, uh, they were ones to buy up all sorts of works, which is why you get things like the uh, first, second, and third Enoch, and why you get the uh, you know the uh, Testament of Moses, the Assumption of Moses, the Testament of Job. You get um, all these different works, the Lost Sayings of Solomon. You have all these people writing these pseudographic works, and then when you get to the New Testament, um, you know, first, second, third, fourth century, you get a lot of people writing things like the Lost Gospel of Thomas, the Lost. The Lost Gospel of Judas. You have all these people writing things. So Rob Ranneberger asked if we have anything on the disciples being baptized. And I'm sure there are stories there. The question is, how many of them are fanciful? How many of them were like, hey, you know, because if Rob has this question, so did people in the second century. And someone writes a letter about Peter's baptism. And when Peter was baptized, the earth opened up and uh, demons were cast out of the pool of Bethesda. You know, like they have all these crazy stories, which a lot of the Catholic Church still carries with them to this day. Um, but I, I'll look into it and I'll, I'll see who's writing the manuscripts and see, um, you know, weigh it against the scriptures for you and see what we come up with. But I'll let you know. Um, so the first uh, work on baptism I want to look at today is the Didache. Uh, and I'm going to go quick on this one because I ran through this last year. It was written around 90 A.D., and this is what it says. Uh, and, and this was written by either one of the apostles or someone who knew one of the apostles. And this is on best church practices in the first century. So this is, this is circulating the same time the book of Revelation, maybe even predates Revelation, um, is circulating around the early churches. And concerning baptism, baptized this way, having first said all these things, baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, so there's the Trinity, uh, in living water. What does living water mean? It means fresh running water. But if you have not uh, living water, baptize into other water. And if you cannot, in cold, in warm. But if you have not either, pour out water thrice upon the head, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, um, and so the point is, is there's an order to the best water to use. Uh, but before the baptism, let the baptizer fast uh, and the baptized and, uh, and whatever others can. Um, and you shall order the baptized to fast one or two days before. So there's people in the church that are to baptize on behalf of those getting baptized. So the, the, I'm sorry, the, the, there's the church baptized or fasting for the, those getting baptized, that God would meet them. And then those who are being baptized are to fast. Um, and so that's, I think, really cool. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a period of preparation for the fast. Um, the second work I want to look at is the first apology of Justin Martyr, uh, written around 150 AD. So this is... Uh, 55 years after Revelation, uh, maybe 50 years after, a um, little less, a little more after um, 1 John. 
I will also relate the manner uh, in which we dedicate ourselves to God when we have been made new through Christ. Lest, if we omit this, we seem to be unfair in the explanation we are making. As many as are persuaded and believe that what we teach and say is true and undertake to be able to live accordingly are instructed to pray and to entreat God with fasting for the remission of their sins that are past. We praying and fasting with them. Again, here's a theme that, that those about to be baptized should go in fasting and those within the church, if they feel so inclined, should also fast on behalf of half of them. Uh, and everybody should be praying for those being baptized. Then they are brought by us where there is water and are regenerated in the same manner in which we are we were ourselves we regenerated. So they, they go to a body of water. And again, there isn't two baptistries. And, and this is really important. Baptism is the great equalizer. There is no poor person and rich person baptistry. The nobleman and the peasant went down in the same exact waters uh, and born again under the same father. It is, it is the unifying force, um, symbology, uh, act of the church, which is why, you know, when Paul says, what some of you say you're from Paul, some of Apollos, some from Cephas, and... <laughs> And Paul goes, haven't you all been baptized uh, in Christ? And so again, baptism is the great equalizer. Uh, for the name, um, for the name of God, the Father and Lord of the universe, and of our Savior Jesus Christ, and of the Holy Spirit. So there's the the Trinity again. A lot of people like to say that the Trinity was a late. Um, Constantine invented the Trinity or the, the, these councils. And, you know, here we are in the Great Commission. Here we are in the Didache in 90. Here we are in 150. And we, we very clearly, there is a doctrine of the Trinity here. Uh, they then received the washing with water. For Christ also said, except ye be born again, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now that it is impossible for those who have once been born to enter into their mother's womb is manifest to all, and how those who have sinned and repent shall escape their sins is declared by Asesia the prophet. As I wrote above, we thus speak, wash you, make you clean, put away all evil of your doings from your souls, learn to do well, judge the fatherless, and plead for the widow, and come and let us reason together, saith the Lord, and though your sins be as scarlet, I will make them white like wool, and though they be as crimson, I make them white as snow. But ye, if ye refuse and rebel, the sword shall devour you, and the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. So denying baptism, according to Justin Martyr 150, is as denying Christ. And for this right, we have learned from the apostles this reason. Since at our birth we were born without our, our knowledge or choice by our parents coming together and we were brought up in bad habits and wicked training in order that we might not remain the children of necessity and of ignorance. Being baptized to Justin is as being born again. And it's a time to, I love what he says, to unlearn bad habits. At your baptism, you die and are born again. At your baptism, you put away your bad habits. At baptism, you put away your wicked training. You know, all the things you learned about scheming and manipulation and bad doctrine and you know, playing games or whatever, all of that dies at your baptism. You are totally made new. And that not only means your, your passions and your code of ethics, uh, but it also is your past knowledge. Those things have to be brought through the baptismal waters, and the good things can come through, but the bad habits and the wicked training have to die there. But many become the children of choice and knowledge and may obtain in the water the remission of, of sins formerly committed, there is pronounced over him who chooses to be born again and is repented of his sins, 
the name of uh, God, the Father, and the Lord of the universe. He who leads to the lair, the person that is being washed, calling him by his name alone. Here is absolute allegiance to Jesus Christ. I love it. For no one can utter the name of the ineffable God, and if anyone dared to say that there is a name, he raves with a hopeless madness. And this washing is called illumination, because they who learn these things are illuminated in their understandings. Justin really puts a real emphasis on the mind of the believer, the wicked dying and illumination beginning. There, there is something that happens at baptism. That yes, we symbolically are washed free of our sins. We're washed of our wickedness. We're washed of our bad habits. He goes on to say, in the name of Jesus Christ, who was crucified under Pontius Pilate, and in the name of the Holy Ghost, who through the prophets foretold all these things about Jesus, he who is illuminated is washed. Those who have come to faith get washed. He's he's almost saying, if God has grabbed you, if God has called you his own, he's turned on the lights, you will go down into that water. You will not go down into that water if you have not been illuminated. But if you've been illuminated, you will go down into that water. And going down into that water is illumination. He puts these things side by side. He's he's saying, when you go down to that water, you're illuminated. But because you went down into that water, you were illuminated. <laughs> he's almost talking about it as as two sides of the same coin, that that when the lights come on in a believer, they do go down in that water, which I, I find really, really awesome. And so the early church took baptism really seriously, really seriously, um, because God takes baptism really seriously. Uh, and again, the way the Great Commission is written, and, and Justin, a martyr, um, the martyr puts it, you know, very similarly, you know, this is, this is salvation 101. You go down into that water. This is what happens. Now, the last work I want to look at is by Tertullian, and this is written around 190 AD. I really hope you guys are finding this interesting because to me, this is just gold. Um, <clears throat> Tertullian, and, and there's some really cool stuff uh to my knowledge and, and again i'm i'm not a church historian that's not my um i can't say that's my specialty but um to my knowledge this is the earliest full-length uh treaty that the church has on baptism i believe this is the first full book on baptism that the the church has the early manuscripts that have survived uh if there's something earlier i'm unaware of it uh but i believe this is it so first book on baptism, <laughs> uh, written by Tertullian, and it has lots of chapters in it. Um, it it's, it's a worthwhile read, uh, if anyone's interested. It's, uh, his name's T-E-R-T-U-L-L-I-A-N, uh, and it's just of baptism. <laughs> uh, if you want to read it, it'll take you, yeah, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. Uh, totally worth it, I think, if you're interested in the subject of baptism in church history. Uh, but in chapter one, he starts off by addressing a Canaanite heresy. Um, so in the early church, uh, and around the latter of the second century, there was a movement uh, that began of people who thought Cain was a good guy. Uh, he was a model for people to follow. Uh, and there seems to be a woman who is the leader of this group. And, and one of the first things this woman did, I'm gathering, uh, is she started to pervert baptism. So she made war against baptism. Um, and that seems to be the reason why uh, Tertullian wrote this letter. A lot of our early church writings are really not so much like this is a commentary on Ephesians or Romans. Uh, they didn't write things that way. They wrote a lot of things uh, re apologetics works, refuting heresies. And so um, here is the, the opening to the letter. He's refuting the Canaanite heresy that the early church, uh, second century, was dealing with. Uh, and then he goes on to chapter four, let no one say, 
Why then are we, pray, baptized with the very waters which then existed in the first beginning? Uh, now, with those waters, of course, except so far, and the genius indeed is one, but the species very many. But what is an attribute to the genius reappears likewise in the species. And accordingly, it makes no difference whether a man be washed in a sea or a pool, a stream or a fount, a lake or a trough, nor is there any uh, distinction between those whom John baptized in the Jordan and those whom Peter baptized in the Tiber, unless... Now, withal, the eunuch whom Philip baptized in the midst of his journey with chance water derived therefrom more or less of salvation than others. All waters, therefore, in virtue of the pristine village, uh, privilege of their origin do, after invocation of God, attain the sacramental powers of sanctification. Maybe you don't want to read this. I don't know. <laughs> but... What he's saying, and I love it, I love it, he's talking about it doesn't matter where you're baptized. So, again, put yourself late second century. You have all these Gnostic groups, all these heresies popping up, and you have people saying that they have the authorized baptism, or they have these secret waters to be baptized in, and these are the waters that Jesus baptized in, and that will heal you of your ailments. And all these funny things started to crop up. And here Tertullian goes, it doesn't matter where you're baptized. Get baptized in the ocean, in the lake, in the bathtub. <laughs> Just get baptized. And he goes on to say a little earlier, <coughs> he goes on to talk about how they're all interconnected anyways. They all are given from God. And I think that's a, I don't want to stretch what he's trying to say, but I believe, I believe what he's getting at is the waters that Jesus got baptized in are the same waters that John baptized in, are the same waters that Peter got baptized, the same water the eunuch got baptized in. It's, it's all God's creation. So what does it matter if it's in a pool or a bathhouse or in a trough or wherever? It's God's water. And, and really cool thinking about the the the, um, the water cycle, um, you know, all that water eventually heats up, turns into a gas, goes up, precipitates and rains, <laughs> falls down, goes into aquifers, pops up in other places, clouds travel. I mean, you know, the water from the Jordan very likely could be here in, you know, the reservoir in, in Baltimore County. You know, little traces of it. It's it's all the same water anyways, which is just kind of a, a cool thought. But what he's really getting at is there's no secret baptismal spot. <laughs> um, and of course, the Didache says you want running water. And here he's this guy saying it doesn't matter. But what he's getting at is not that... <laughs> um, it doesn't matter what your baptism practice is. What he's, what he's getting at is there is no secret pilgrimage a Christian has to make to make a baptism valid. He goes on to say in verse 6, Not that in the waters we obtain the Holy Spirit, but in the water, under the witness of the angel, we are cleansed and prepared for the Holy Spirit. In this case also, a type has proceeded for thus was John beforehand the Lord's forerunner, preparing his ways. Thus, too, does the angel, the witness of baptism, make the paths straight. For the Holy Spirit, who is about to come upon us by the washing away of sins, which faith sealed in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, obtains. So, this is really interesting. And again, I'm not saying all these guys are right, but it's worth chewing on. He's saying, baptism does not equate to salvation but he's saying baptism prepares us for the the imparting of the holy spirit um now i don't quite know what his uh, soteriology is what his doctrine of salvation is uh, what i'm assuming he's saying is god god illuminates the person to get baptized the person gets baptized. It's an act of repentance, of washing away their sins. I'm dead to the world. I'm born a new life. And at that instant, 
the Holy Spirit comes down. It's not that the baptism saves, it's that the baptism prepares the person to receive the Holy Spirit. That's the order that it's done. And that certainly uh, reads true um, in, in, in the book of Acts. The Spirit descends once the believer's been baptized. Um, and I like that he's saying baptism doesn't isn't the act of salvation, but it prepares us for the Holy Spirit. I think that's really interesting. Uh, verse 17, uh, two more chapters here. Of giving it the chief priest, who is uh, the bishop. So this is set you know later in the book. He has uh, has the right in the next place. The presbyter and deacons, and yet not without the bishop's authority, on account of the honor of the church, which being preserved, peace is perseverance here's here's what's really cool <clears throat> or what i like what he's saying there were so many cults in the first century uh in the second century there's so many now <laughs> and at this time there was this woman running this canaanite heresy and she was baptizing people under um it seems to be maybe under the name of satan but it was a, it was a wrong baptism. It wasn't part of the church. It was something other than it was a different gospel. And and so what what Tertullian was getting at is he says you know he wants approved leaders um, to be there for these baptisms. He wanted presbyters and deacons or uh, chief priests or bishops. Um, he he wanted respectable men overseeing baptism to make sure that these new converts weren't being baptized into bad places, into evil places. Um, I, again, I find that I find that interesting. I think it's a little a, a very illuminating on the state of how things were for the first few hundred years, about how chaotic things were, and how many evil people saw an opportunity to get rich or find a following. As Christianity was the new religion sweeping Europe, uh, there was a lot to do and, and a lot of things to manage. Uh, and then um, chapter 18, the Lord does indeed say, this is our last chapter, forbid them not to come unto me, let them come, then while they are growing up, let them come while they are learning, while they are learning whether to come, let them become Christians when they have become able to know Christ. Why does the innocent period of life hasten to the remission of sins? Now, there is no thing in the Bible that says there is an age of accountability. But when you look at the scriptures, when you look at different places, when you're reading the early church, there seems to be an innocent period. There seems to be a period where a kid, he doesn't know right or wrong. He's a kid. <laughs> uh, and so a lot of times when you see babies that die young, um, you know, it's like, what happens to that child's soul? Well, you know, I, I'm of the persuasion that they they go to heaven. Um, and, and that's where the doctrine of innocence or... Um, the uh, age of accountability can, can come in. <clears throat> um, and here, Tertullian's saying, why, why do we have children rushing to baptism uh, when they are in the age of innocence? He goes on to say, more caution will be exercised in worldly manners so that, no, so that one who is not trusted with earthly substance is trusted with divine. Let them know how to ask for salvation that you may seem at last to have given to him that asks for no less cause must be unwedded also be deferred in whom the ground of temptation is prepared alike in such as never were wedded by means of their maturity and in the widowed by means of their freedom until they either marry or else be more fully strengthened for con uh, uh, continence. If any understand the weighty impart of baptism, they will fear its reception more than its delay. Sound faith is secure of salvation. And this is what I want to close on. Tertullian 
is saying that children shouldn't rush into baptism because baptism is an acknowledgement of sins. It's a washing of way of sins and de dedicating yourself to walk in newness of life. And he's saying, why would we have children and kids make mistakes, kids, kids fall into all sorts of sins because they're kids and, and, and they don't know and they don't have a handle on things. He says, you know, kids should be, mo we should be more afraid to baptize our kids early than to delay because to enter them into this phase, to wash, to have them step into um, the baptismal waters, to come into the baptismal waters is to announce to the world, to everybody, that they are washing away their sins. They're acknowledging that there is sin in their life, thus is removing the age of innocence. Now, again, I'm not saying this is true. But this is something pretty heavy to think about. We, we, and we shouldn't be too speedy to baptize our kids. We need to make sure that they know what they're doing. We need to make sure that they're old enough to understand what this is. And that, you know, I, I talked to a, um, a, a little kid yesterday who wanted to be baptized. And I said, listen, I said, I'll baptize you. But I need to make sure that your salvation, that, that you are sure in your salvation, that you love Jesus. You're not doing this because you want to make your parents happy. You're doing this because you want to do this. And I said, and you know, when you get baptized, you're saying, I'm going to live um, like a really good Christian. I said, you know, and, and you're going to have to really work to be good and not argue and fight. And and the kid just looked at me like, who? <laughs> <laughs> and uh but it's this is what Tertullian's getting at we we have to you know our our children need to understand the weightiness of this uh before they enter into it so anyways um that's it rob's bringing up that um cornelius uh they received the spirit and then got baptized and there is uh there are people that get the spirit before they're baptized but the large majority the the spirit seems to come after or maybe it's half and half but Certainly in Jesus's case, the spirit came after and at Pentecost and all sorts of things. So God knows. <laughs> um, but certainly it is connected with baptism uh, constantly, uh, the, the giving of the Holy Spirit um, throughout the book of Acts. Anyways, I love you all. For those of you that made it through the church history, uh, beside, I'm proud of you. I think it's really interesting stuff. Um, and, and something for us to chew on, especially if our Great Commission is to share the gospel and to get people baptized. We need to understand the seriousness of baptism and have, you know, a pretty robust idea, you know, um, <sighs> we need to understand what baptism is and the seriousness of it and, you know, be able to apply it and figure out how to apply it and encourage it. Uh, to others in a healthy way. So anyways, let's pray. God, we love you. We praise you and we thank you. We ask for a wonderful, wonderful day today. Uh, we thank you for the people that have preceded us and gone before us. And we love you, God. We ask for your strength. We ask for mercy. We ask for your guidance. We love you. We pray for a good church baptism that's coming up. We love you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you guys. I'll see you Sunday. Glad you could join us for Calvary Baltimore B-Sides. If you'd like to know more about us, visit calvarychapelbaltimore.org. Our email address is calvarybaltimore1 at gmail.com. That's calvarybaltimore, then the number one, at gmail.com. To financially support the work God is doing through Calvary Baltimore, go to calvarychapelbaltimore.org and click Give. And if you're in the area, stop by on a Sunday morning. For directions and service times, go to our website at calvarychapelbaltimore.org. Live streams and weekly sermons are available on our website, our Facebook page, and YouTube. You can also watch with our mobile app and on Apple TV and Roku. Search for Calvary Chapel Baltimore on these platforms for instant access to great Bible teaching and encouragement. We hope you've been blessed by this week's teaching. Until next time, as Pastor Josh says, study the Word, to live the Word, to share the Word. 
and join us again for the next Calvary Baltimore B-Side.